welcome back to 316 Exposure. Again, this is Stephen, and today I would like to preface uh, the presentation with a quick message. Uh, Jesus knew all too well that lots of people who read scriptures did not really understand them. It's true today, and it was true in the first century. Modern Christians disagree over all sorts of issues, baptism, spiritual gifts, end times, church government, and so on. And if you read church's history, you'll soon discover that we're not the first generation like that. So Christians often ask, is the Bible clear? Uh, surely if it were, we would all agree on what it meant, right? Uh, so there are two answers we could give that question. The first, when it comes to the essentials, we do agree. We all agree, all Christians everywhere believe in one church, one spirit, one hope, one Lord Jesus Christ, one faith, one baptism, and of course, one God. The second answer to that question, if the Bible were clear, wouldn't we all agree about everything, is not necessarily. There are all sorts of things on our end, ignorance, hard-heartedness, sin, rebellion, unbelief, that might prevent us from understanding what Scripture says quite clearly. In fact, when Jesus interacted with people who had misunderstood something he said, either in Scripture or in person, he never blamed the Word of God for being unclear, confusing, or obscure. Instead, he always said it was something to do with the readers or hearers. So, with that said, I want to make a point that a number of things I teach may be untrue. I, I never intend to teach wrongly, of course. I am fallible. And I work hard to ensure my teaching is accurate and as helpful as possible. But the reality is, I will teach some things that might be incorrect. And when that happens, though, I don't want anyone to think it's because the Bible isn't clear where it intends to be. Uh, it may be that the Bible wasn't intended to address that particular question I'm asking. Or it may be that I've been waylaid by some combination of ignorance, carelessness, and sin. It certainly won't be because the scriptures are an incoherent mess. The Bible says, your word is a lamp for my feet. The psalmist wrote, and a light to my path. When you're walking along a dark and narrow track, you can't always trust your judgment, but you can always trust the light. I've spent hours pondering the topic of this video. I tossed around, of course, the popular topics, Epstein, abortion, sex trafficking, educational issues, and the list goes on. I began to realize that the multitude of evil has been increasing dramatically for the past decade. You have to wonder, are all these variants of evil simply meant to be a distraction from our true calling? A distraction away from something even more evil than any of the topics I just mentioned. So today I want to delve into the book of Revelation, particularly the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. This week, the Texas Department of Public Safety issued a bulletin warning that a review of ISIS social media messaging indicates they're showing interest in trying to sneak across the southwest border from Mexico for a terror attack inside the U.S. Arizona, Texas or uh, San Diego, California, we, we know that there's folks coming over from the Middle East and, and Southwest Asia and, and they're using Mexico to get north into the U.S. So here's what we just found out. Uh, five Pakistanis and one Af Afghan were apprehended 15 miles north into Arizona. They were flown from the Middle East to, to Brazil. Then they went through uh, Peru. And they, they went all the way up through Panama in, into Mexico, and now they ended up in the U.S. The five Pakistanis, as far as we know, got away. They Channel 2 Action News has obtained evidence that terrorists are crossing the southwest border from Mexico. In May, we revealed how thousands of illegals from nations that sponsor terror, like Yemen, are being caught entering. Our stories went viral. Nearly 11 million people saw them. Still in June, Homeland Security said there's no credible information terrorists are operating at the border. So we went back and found government documents that contradict that. The Border Patrol has captured thousands of people called OTMs other than Mexicans. Many are from nations that have harbored terrorists like Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan, Sudan, Somalia, Pakistan, and Yemen. The federal government calls people from those nations SIAs or special interest aliens. The government has offered very little detail about the number of actual terrorists caught on the border. Retired INS agent Michael Cutler says the terrorist border threat has been covered up. The government is attempting to keep the citizens of our country like a bunch of mushrooms. You know, keep us in the dark and feed us a lot of uh, manure. Here is my simplest explanation of the book of Revelation. 
especially the first four horses of the apocalypse. The question is, why these four and why these colors? So I'm going to submit to you that there is information contained in these colors. God is not trying to confuse us, and he's not just throwing colors out there. Is he? No. There must be a rational justification for why he picked these four. Take a look at your screen and just follow with me. What do you see? Here is the symbol of the national symbol of next door neighbor to Israel, Jordan. What colors can you see? You can help me here. White, red, black, and green. Okay, and then if you go next door inside the territory of Israel, there's the Palestine symbolized by that flag. Well, guess what? They look the same, don't they? So when people say the Palestinians needed a homeland, guess what? They got it. It's called Jordan. When they divided Palestine, which used to be much bigger, 70-odd percent of Palestines went to Jordan. It was called Transjordan in the beginning, and then Jordan was the part where Palestines were to live. So if, again, you're looking for a homeland for the Palestinians, Jordan should be opening up the floodgates and saying, welcome, we welcome the immigrants. Why don't they? But flags tell you something. Colors tell you something. Let's go on. What colors do you see on the national flag of Sudan? This is another player in World War III, according to Ezekiel 38:39. Help me out again. Do you see white, red, black, and green? Okay, let's go to Kuwait. And what do you see? Let's go to the United Arab Emirates. What colors do you see there? Again, white, red, black, and green. All right, let's just do, let's just go to Libya because it could be a coincidence. Here, what colors do you see? Let's go to Afghanistan. What do you see? Let's go to Syria. Again, what do you see? Let's go to Iraq. What do you see? I wonder if God has successfully communicated something through simple colors. Why is it so complicated? Why do prophecy teachers make it so hard? My guess would be because they watched the news first. In the days when Gorbachev was around and he was the enemy of Ronald Reagan, then it was Russia. Russia is the Antichrist. The White Horse is now China. China is going to invade Israel. I don't know if China is going to invade Israel. I don't know. But what I know is God said look for white, red, black, and green, right? And if you look at it, what is ISIS trying to do? It's trying to combine Syria and Iraq. Here, let me flip that. Syria and Iraq. Iraq and Syria. Why are they so similar? Because historically, they were the same empire. They were the same country. So ISIS is not as crazy as you think. There is a historical root to what is going on and what is being played out right now. Now let's compare that to the flags of other nations. If you look at the flag of New Zealand, it's almost a copy of the flag of Australia because there's an intimate relationship there, a connection between the two countries. You can see the relationship and the history and the legacy of nations through the flags and their colors and symbols. God is aware of that and I guess Christians should be as well. Amen. Now let's compare the colors of the four horsemen to these other flags and they just don't match. Let's go to other countries. The first flag on the left, America, doesn't match. The second one, Norway, again, no match. The third one, Russia, to Americans, the evil empire. But they are passing more Christian laws than America is right now. Uh, Putin is the one that is criticizing the West, saying that the West has now become uh, so, quote-unquote, egalitarian. Uh, that faith in God and faith in Satan is equal. He says that's the path to degradation. Vladimir Putin, he's not my hero, and he's certainly not my president, but I'll tell you what, it does make a lot of sense. When you equate the belief in God, the God that gave us the Judeo-Christian value philosophy and religion that built the best civilizations in the world, when you equate that with the belief in idols or Lucifer himself, something's going to go wrong, amen. But look at all these countries that will be leading World War III. Uh, all share the same four colors on their flags. God is not trying to confuse us, he has spoken very simply. So those are the first four seals. Let's continue with the fourth seal. Revelation 6 verse 8, verse 8 continues and says, And power was given to them over the fourth of the earth, to kill with the sword, with hunger, with death. Please read it carefully. It does not say that a quarter of a million humans will die. When you read it, it says, And power was given to them over one quarter of the earth. And suddenly everybody you know thinks that means a quarter of the earth will die. Does it say that? It doesn't say that at all. 
It says power was given to them, the enemies, over one quarter of the earth, and things that they will do will be to kill with the sword. Again, the sword keeps coming up, doesn't it? Knives keep coming up. Basically, not guns, not guns. In fact, I mean, if you read Revelations, you want not gun control laws, you want knife control laws. But we can't do that, can we? So this is called hyperbole, an exaggeration of what is written. Uh, they they catch a word and then they just make up leaps and bounds of interpretation. Try not to do that because if you do that with this verse, it would mean 1.75 billion people dead by the fourth seal. And that's not going to happen. That's an exaggeration. But realize that a lot of the events in the book of Revelation and the Bible, they're just going to happen and almost go unaware, unnoticed by people. It happened in the first coming, didn't it? And the believers thought, what if the Messiah comes? He's got to be powerful. It's got to be tough. He's got to have like two knives and he's going to lead us to a great war and victory over our enemies, the Gentiles and the Romans. That is precisely why the Pharisees missed the Messiah because people were looking for something so spectacular. <clears throat> Pardon me. I'm telling you what it's not. It's not Hollywood. I don't think there's ever going to be a 200 meter tsunami that engulfs the Statue of Liberty. I don't see it in the Bible. Even in the worst of times on this planet, the mercy of God is still here. God is still protecting as many people as he can. The fact is a quarter of the human population is currently under Islamic control. The fifth seal, Revelation 6 verse 9. Let's read it together. When the Lamb broke the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of all who had been martyred for the word of God and for, their faith, for them being faithful in their testimony. So in the fifth seal, what we're going to see is martyrdom. It continues and it says, And they cried with a loud voice, saying, Oh, how long, O Lord, holy and true dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And that's a good question. Many saints have asked that, How long? How long have you, you asked that when you pray? How long, how long? Mercy. Let's continue. Lemon and white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest for yet a little season. And I like that. Just a little bit more until their fellow servants, also their brethren, that should be killed as they were, should be filled. Uh, let's now harmonize that with a couple of other scriptures. There is martyrdom. What kind of martyrdom? Well, check it out. When they get to heaven, look at what had happened to them. Revelation 20, verse 4, goes back in time and it tells you what happened. It says, And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witnesses of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark. So listen, don't take the mark. Whatever the mark is, don't take the mark. Upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. So we see a characteristic of the end time is cruel decapitation. I wonder if this is happening. I wonder if this is being fulfilled. I'm going to give you one more scripture. I believe that God gives typology. He gives foreshadowing of what happens. He gives you something that happened before the real thing happens. Um, it's a metaphor and then the real thing. Uh, metaphor and then the real thing. You killed the lamb and then you crucified Jesus. Makes sense. I hope so. Well, check this out. In Luke chapter 9, verse 9, Herod, representing the world power of the world, Herod said, John, I have beheaded, but whom is this of whom I hear such things? He desired to see him. John was the forerunner of Jesus in his first coming. John does what Elijah will do at Jesus' second coming. John ushers Jesus' first coming, just like Elijah will usher Jesus' second coming. So what happened to John? What happened to the forerunner before the appearances of the Messiah, just before the first revelation of Christ, the forerunner? He was beheaded. Could this be the same just before the second coming? Many of you may know the prophet Rick Joyner. Uh, I regard him highly as a prophet. Uh, he issued a warning back on September 18, 2014. In that warning, he said in a vision that he saw the gate of hell has been opened. And what he meant by that is ISIS is coming to America. He saw demonized gangs. He saw killings. He says killings so bad that it makes the beheadings look good. He went on to say they will come through the southern border and torture people in such cruel ways as never been seen before. And he said it's going to start from the south. And when it does, when the beheadings happen, the people will revolt. They will say, where was our government? They will issue martial law, but it won't work. And then there will be anarchy. People will be rising up. Do you think it's possible? And he said it will start from the south. So let's now take a look at what's been happening. 
Let's rewind back to the year 2014. Uh, August the 19th, James Foley was beheaded on YouTube. And that was an unprecedented event, wasn't it? Uh, the whole world saw what the Bible has declared to be the fifth seal. Now you might say, but these people aren't Christian. I know. Do you know how many Christians, millions of Christians, get killed and the secular media will not care? I mean, how many thousands of Christians just in Syria alone have been killed and tortured? So what we're going to see on TV is not necessarily the persecution of Christians that we're reading about in the Bible. Now, let's be honest, because they don't care about us. But when one of their own reporters gets beheaded, one reporter for probably thousands and tens of thousands of Christians will become news. It still fulfills the Bible. And look, whether it's Christian or non-Christian, it's a human being. It's a person that God made, and he loves all of them and cares about them. Amen. So I think very much we're talking about the opening of the fifth seal right in front of our eyes. Am I absolute about it? No. If we get further information, if we get further news, I might have to update because this is, I guess, the privilege of being a flawed human being. Uh, we teach in part, and we see in part, and we know in part, and we prophecy in part. Only when Jesus has come, then we no longer need teachers. Okay, moving on. September 2nd, 2014, we had the beheading of Stephen Sotloff, uh, another American who happened to be Jewish. Uh, the 13th of September, you had the beheading of British aid worker David Haynes. Okay, this one kind of escaped the news, but did you know that an 82-year-old grandmother in the UK got beheaded in her own garden? It was not a gardening accident, and if you read it, you'll find out, but you have to dig a little bit. It was a Muslim convert who beheaded this grandmother in her garden. A 54-year-old woman, Colleen Hufford, was beheaded in Oklahoma, USA. Do you think it was by Christian people? They say, well, faith doesn't matter, you know. This has nothing to do with faith. Well, faith governs action. Belief governs behavior. If you believe it's good to go to work, I'm going to see you hardworking, and that will be your behavior. Belief governs behavior, otherwise, why would we have beliefs? It's so absurd to say that it has nothing to do with faith when it has everything to do with faith. And some will say it is poverty. Well, Christians live in poverty and you don't see them going around beheading, beheading people. They will blame things. They will deceive you with many strong delusions. And unfortunately, it's an age where the Bible predicts that many will happily receive the deception when the facts are very clear. I have to ask, has it arrived like Rick Joyner saw? I need to tell you about one more story um, amongst thousands that happened here very recently. Islamic Jihad has recently gang raped a 60 year old Christian woman to the triumphant cries of Allah Akbar before stoning her to death. When no one in her small Christian village saw Susan Grigor or Gregory, the worried priest sent parishioners to search for her. They eventually found her mangled and bloodied corpse on the ground of a field adjacent to her home. The autopsy revealed that Susan had been repeatedly raped and tortured over the course of nine hours before being murdered by stoning. The men responsible for this heinous act are believed to be members of the Al-Qaeda-linked jihadist group Al-Nusra, elements of which the Obama administration referred to and supported as freedom fighters. Described as a pious Christian and pillar of her community, Susan had never married and lived an entire life as a virgin suggesting that violent rape was her first and last sexual experience. Although she never had any of her own, Susan loved children. After retiring, volunteered much of her time helping educate the youth of her local church and developing their skills. Before that, she was an Arabic language school teacher for over 30 years and an avid gardener. The following is a translation of one of the earliest reports of this incident, uh, written in Arabic by a local acquaintance. They rape, they kill, they rob, and they fornicate while proclaiming Allah Akbar, meaning Allah is greater. Uh, who, I wonder, is this God they worship? Surely it is the God of demons. I certainly could not call them animals, for animals are cleaner and more merciful. Susan was 60 and spent her life educating generations of her village. According to forensics, the 60-year-old was, woman was gang raped for nine continuous hours before being stoned to death. What did this virgin woman, who was never before touched by a man, feel between their filthy hands? As they gored her flesh toward her chastity. What physical pain? What spiritual pain? What humiliation? The report goes on to note what may be the most deplorable aspect of this incident. Uh, one that English language media reports on this incident failed to mention. It continues. Her rapists and murderers are from the organization Al-Nasir. 
Some of them are foreigners, but others are from the same area. In other words, those who raped and stoned her are themselves from among her former students and neighbors, whom she taught Arabic in school over the course of 30 years. Surely she never dreamt to see such depraved savagery in the eyes of her former students. But nonetheless, they preyed on her like wild beasts, even though the wild beasts do not rape their mothers. I mean, you think about it. Think about it yourself. If this starts happening next door to you when you're having, I don't know, maybe lunch, and somebody takes a knife and starts cutting somebody's head off, what are you going to do? I mean, really, what are you going to do? So I don't know. I don't know how it's going to play out. Here it looks like in the United States we are very well protected, and we have a lot of grace. But I would not become complacent. Rick Joyner said that if we fast and pray, if we see God's face, if we intercede, maybe some of the things can be averted in our time. Maybe, you know, it can happen after we're gone, during the tribulation. We don't want this stuff to happen, but I won't. I won't be complacent about it. I speak to you as friends, as my brothers and sisters in Christ, and I say to you, it's about time to get serious with our faith. God trusted in each and every one of us with one specific task, to become fishers of men. So pick up your sword, put on your armor of God, and get to work. To me, that's the least we can do. Amen. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for listening again. I hope you enjoyed this message. Uh, Please remember to like, share, and subscribe. And until next time, God bless you and your families. Thank you.